is no question that 2022 was a challenging year from a macro standpoint. So where are we in the macro cycle? Nancy, it's something that's been very much on our mind these past few years. In our study two years ago, back in February 2021, we posed the question, are today's public equity markets overvalued? One of our favorite metrics is the Warren Buffett ratio, which looks at the ratio of total market cap in a country or a region divided by its GDP. You can almost think of it as a PE multiple for a country. Mr. Buffett famously said that if you looked at that ratio for the US in 1999 and 2000, you would have seen the dot-com bubble for what it was. But the challenge with calculating that ratio today just by looking at U.S. market cap and dividing it by U.S. GDP is that, well, first of all, U.S. companies are very global today. My, my colleague Frisco will share more about that later when she talks about Model 1 countries whose total addressable market is the entire world. Dividing the market cap of American companies with global P&Ls by just America's GDP is sort of a numerator and denominator mismatch. And second, we want to have a global perspective looking at the market cap of the entire world divided by the GDP of the entire world. That's what we started doing back in early 2021. The left-hand side of this graph shows the growth of global market cap in trillions of US dollars. The middle shows global nominal GDP also in trillions of US dollars. And the chart at the right shows the ratio of the two. By January 2021, the ratio was already higher than the peak just before the 2008 global financial crisis. It felt high. Almost a year later, in November 2021, we had published our third report. And this time, we had a very specific view on whether the global public equity markets were overvalued. There's a wonderful book by the legendary investor Sam Zell called Am I Being Too Subtle? That's how we felt about our message in November 2021. We put it there in a 100-point Garamond. We said yes. If you look at why we said yes, about 14 months ago, in November 2021, it was based on the exact same analysis. The ratio had gone even higher to 1.26x, 126%. That was so much higher than the 107% peak in late 2007 that we felt that markets were definitely reaching their peak. We weren't sure when the final peak would be, but we felt it was only a matter of time. In retrospect, as they say, it's better to be lucky than smart. We were lucky. November 2021 was precisely the peak in the markets, and they've fallen by more than $20 trillion globally since then, which you can see on the left-hand side. More important from our perspective, the ratio has fallen too, from 1.26x to 0.96x. The question that's now on our minds is whether it settles there at 0.96x or whether it falls more. No one can say, of course, with certainty, but consider these data points, which are a histogram of what that ratio has been since 2003. 1.26x was the peak, 0.42x was the trough at the depths of the global financial crisis, and 0.83x down the middle is the 19-year median. We're still north of that, all of which makes us worried that there's probably another 10 to 15% at least in corrections still ahead of us, and perhaps more. When markets correct, they don't just glide down to the median like Captain Sully landing safely on the Hudson. Take a look at this lens. The left-hand side is what we saw before, the growth of total global market cap since 2003. The black line is the trend line. It's a roughly 7.1% annual growth rate. This is the growth rate of human market cap over roughly 20 years. The right-hand side tries to iron out the chart at the left, anchoring around the trend line and looking at the oscillations up and down, high and low. What we can't help but observe is that it's a bit like high school physics when we learned about pendulums. Pull the pendulum a foot this way, it's going to swing back a foot this way. Markets were 50% above trend in 2007, then fell to just under 50% below trend in 2009. It's a little unscientific, but they were 27% above trend in November 2021, and they've only just fallen to 1% below trend now. Markets often overreact, so it's entirely possible there could be a correction of even more than 10 to 15 percent. You know, the late Paul Samuelson joked that the stock market has predicted nine of the last five recessions. Does this mean that there's going to be a recession in 2023, or is the stock market overreacting to that? Could this just be a valuation correction and not the harbinger of an economic recession?
<laughs> well, to allude to another economics joke, Ruchir Sharma just wrote an op-ed piece that said, economists see recession coming, so maybe it's not. I think economists are getting a bit of a bad rap there. But plenty of others are trying to convey that it might be a soft landing or not a recession at all. Some of this is entirely sensible messaging by civic leaders, since there can be a recursive loop of worry becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. But as always, we love to try to learn from the past. Take a look at this chart. The dark blue line is the 10-year U.S. Treasury, and the light blue line is the two-year U.S. Treasury. You can see that the dark blue line is typically, but not always, above, higher than the light blue line. The difference between them is called the Treasury spread. And when you plot that, again, you see it's mostly greater than zero, but every once in a while turns negative, what's called an inverted yield curve. That inversion, that moment that it dips below zero, is often a terrific predictor of recessions. In fact, when you see recessions over the past many years, they've typically come somewhere between, call it a, a half a year to two years, after that first moment when that red line dips below zero. The dead red line dipped below zero several months ago, which suggests if the past is any judge, a recession is imminent sometime in 2023. But it's funny, like they used to say in the 1990s, you could see the evidence of the productivity of technology everywhere but in the productivity statistics. You can see the evidence of an upcoming recession everywhere but in the forecast for earnings per share for the S&P 500. Again, we're using a very U.S. set of numbers over here because the data is available, but this is generally applicable to the entire world because these companies are, in many cases, multinationals. What you're looking at over here is quarter by quarter the actual delivered earnings per share for the roughly 500 largest American companies. As you can see, when there's a recession, it's brutal. Those earnings dip and cascade downwards in a massively negative way. This next chart shows you what people think is going to happen three quarters from now. You can see that there's already a forecast for three quarters from now, and you can see forecasts from years past. There's two things worth pointing out. Three quarters in advance, almost nobody saw the 2008 recession coming. Almost nobody saw, for different reasons, the COVID recession coming. And right now, despite the inverted yield curve and despite raising rates, no one is really calling for a dramatic decline in earnings per share. We find this very, very puzzling. It's true when you even take a larger or a longer term view. This is the forecast seven quarters out, built up for the S&P 500. It's only until well into the recession in the past that people have actually begun to predict what those earnings would be. And very rarely do they tend to be accurate. And right now again as well, no one is predicting the kind of dramatic drop in earnings per share that it would be typically associated with a recession, which is what we think will likely happen over the next 12 months. Here's another way of looking at it. If we had the data quarter by quarter of what people originally thought was going to be the earnings in the past and getting closer and closer to the actual date but looking at it in advance, what you see is a consistent pattern almost like grass blowing in the wind of downward lines. The way to think about this is people thought next year's earnings would be here and as it got closer and closer to reality, they kept having to tone down their expectations until it actually turned into the actual number. This is not a great fact pattern. It actually says that there's systematic optimism bias among many forecasters that look at the largest group of companies in the world. The other way to look at it would be to say, all right, at every moment in time, what did people think was going to happen next? For example, at Q3 2017, what did people think the next seven quarters of earnings would be? This looks like grass blowing in the other direction. It's consistently over-optimistic, and like that broken clock that's right twice a day, it's only occasionally directionally accurate. Most of the time, we over-index and overestimate, and we think that's exactly what's happening now as people start to model earnings for 2023 and 24. Those numbers will come down a lot, a lot more than this is forecasting if a recession actually takes place. Now, you might be asking, you've been thinking a lot about the U.S., talking a lot about the U.S., how is this possibly relevant to Southeast Asia? Well, on this chart, what you see is in black, the United States' GDP growth rate year by year going back quite a bit. And you also see Southeast Asia's five largest economies, the ASEAN 5. You see all emerging markets and the entire world. And in general, over the past 20 odd years, these have been correlated. Not perfectly. We're proud of the fact that ASEAN does march a bit to its own drum. But in general, if the U.S. has a cold, we might have three colds because emerging markets often move in lockstep. 
to what's happening on a global basis. So what's happening in America and the likelihood of a recession there does have great importance for us here in Southeast Asia. How does a startup founder's job change in a recession? How should their planning adapt? The job of a CEO has gotten much, much harder over these past few months as a recession looks increasingly imminent and their planning has to adapt to changing times. We love trying to contextualize what a recession looks like, particularly from the standpoints of the capital markets because that has a great bearing on a company's ability to raise capital and eventually seek capital market exits in the IPO and aftermath markets. What you're looking at at the top is the US S&P 500 over almost 100 years. And at the bottom, over the same time period, although the index only began in the 70s, the US NASDAQ. But we're plotting these two important indices in a very different way. Instead of showing it the usual up and to the right with ups and downs, we say at every moment in time when there was a kind of high water mark, when the index reached a new high and then subsequently fell from that high, how long did it take to recover to the most recent high? The results are dramatic. Look at the Great Depression. You can see the enormously long time it took for markets to recover from the massive overvaluation of 1929. It took a while in the 1970s to recover from the go-go years of the 1960s. It took a while at the dot-com bubble, and it took a while after the global financial crisis. And where we are right now, as painful as 2022 was, is actually relatively sort of midstream in a correction relative to the magnitude of corrections in years past. That is not just true for the overall corporate environment, it's true for tech. Now the NASDAQ doesn't go back beyond 1970 or 71, but what you can see are many punctuated episodes of NASDAQ declines, the most awful of which of course was the dot-com crisis. We haven't even begun to get close to the magnitude of declines that took place in that crisis, which again gives us some food for thought to think that perhaps this correction is not yet completed in terms of where it's likely going to go. What does that mean in terms of an entrepreneur's decision making? We often think about this in terms of very practical rules of thumb that an entrepreneur has to go by, and we take some inspiration from the three laws of physics from Isaac Newton, although apparently the Apple story is apocryphal. Let's start with a basic mathematical fact, so important a fact that actually we're surprised it hasn't been named. We're just gonna call it Nguyen's Law in honor of our co-founder Ken Nguyen, who is often a true contrarian in our investment committee meetings. If A times B equals C and A falls by 50%, B doesn't have to rise by 50% to get back to where the multiplication used to be. B has to rise by 100%. If something falls by 20%, it'll have to rise by 25% to get back to where it was. That's an important mathematical fact. If your earnings fall by 25%, you'll have to grow them by more than 25% to get back to where you once were which leads us to the first law of recession valuations. In a recession, your revenue or gross profit or earnings multiple will usually fall a lot more in percentage terms than the associated metric will rise. Your PE multiple can fall a lot more than your earnings can rise. And that's assuming you have earnings. There's an important corollary. GMV multiples and every other kind of multiple fall as well. It's not just the canonical gap metrics. There's a clear implication. It is almost impossible, although a handful of companies do this, to have a rising share price in a recession. It almost doesn't matter how quickly your P&L is growing. Your multiple is falling faster. Back to Nguyen's law. The second law of recession valuations is that it is a lot easier to raise money if you don't need the money. And there's a clear corollary. Revenue multiples probably don't matter as much anymore. People are going to be looking at your cash flow and not just four or five years from now's cash flow, but your relatively imminent cash flow. And it has a clear implication. It is so much easier and frankly better to spend a dollar less at a time like this than to try to raise a dollar more. Which leads us to our third law of recession valuations. It is actually a bit better to own a bit less of a business that survives than a business that goes bankrupt. In fact, it's more than a bit better. It has a clear corollary. This is the time to be practical in valuation. We don't just say this because we're investors. We say this to all entrepreneurs, including the ones we don't invest in. This is the time to be practical and very pragmatic about valuations and capital raising. And there is also an implication we'll touch on in a minute. When capital supply shrinks, 
a game of musical chairs, just like a children's birthday party, ensues. And in every game of musical chairs, the first person to sit down will win. Raise early. Don't wait for the money from supply or your own balance sheet to run out. You saw this happen at many times in the past. In the dot-com recession, for example, Apple's revenue multiple fell by almost 90%. Over that period of time, its revenues happened to fall as well, but it certainly didn't help that its rev that multiple fell. Amazon's an interesting one. Amazon's revenue multiple fell massively. Over that period of time, its revenues doubled. But when your revenue multiple goes from 12 to 16x and to 2x, it doesn't matter if your revenues doubled. You're still going to have a reduction in your share price. Similar results obtain as well for the global financial crisis. Back to the second law. It's a lot easier to raise money if you don't need the money. Take a look at this. There's a fantastic academic at the University of Florida called Jay Ritter, who's made it his life work to analyze and to quantify US IPOs over a very long period of time. What you're looking at here is just tech IPOs, companies that went public in the US like C did back in 2017, and it shows you what percent of each year's class, cohort of IPOs, were profitable tech companies in green or unprofitable tech companies in red. The results are striking, and much of what you see here is the direct practical result of 40 years of shrinking interest rates. When interest rates fall, investors are more willing to give you credit for outcomes far in the future. In fact, they give you a lot more value for what's called a terminal value than profits right away today. This oscillates up and down, and what you saw, for example, in the dot-com bubble was an enormous expansion of the red, which quickly pulled back, in fact, all the way up to the 2007-8-9 global financial crisis, and then it fell back down again as interest rates fell during a uniquely low period of rates. You can already see the green, uh, uh, the, the, the green section rising. This is hugely important. It's easier to raise a dollar in a recession if you don't need the money. Why does capital dry up in a falling market like this? After all, we keep reading newspaper articles about the dry powder that's surrounding us all around the world. Plenty of venture capital firms and private equity firms raised bumper-sized funds in 2020 and 21 and even 2022. Well, the reality has to do with positive cycles and vicious cycles in a rising market. Investors have an incentive to invest because the good companies may be even more expensive 12 months later. Their revenues might be higher, their margins might be better, the multiples of that might be better, and therefore valuation is probably going to rise. You're probably better off investing now rather than later. And in rising markets as well, particularly for early stage investors that need subsequent rounds to bring their companies to full fruition, it's a lot more plausible that you'll find someone to put that capital in in the next round, rather than needing to reserve your own capital to see your company all the way to cash flow positive. That reverses in a falling market. It's in fact exactly in reverse. It becomes a negative feedback cycle. In a recession, revenues might be lower a year from now. Margins might be lower a year from now. Multiples might be lower a year from now. And therefore, there's a lot of good reasons why valuations might fall. So investors sit on the sidelines waiting to see what might happen, hoping for better prices and better terms in the future. And by the way, that second point is very important. In a falling market, there's even less of a guarantee that subsequent investors will come in and provide growth capital for your company to keep them what accountants would call a going concern. And therefore, you actually need to set up more of a reserve for your existing investments because you need to protect them at all cost. We saw this working in a very tragic way in the dot-com implosion of 1999, 2000, 2001, and 2002. There's a terrific data set that looked at, again, from a US perspective, what was the pitter-patter of bankruptcies? The graph at the bottom corresponds to the shaded area in the chart at the top, and the chart at the top is exactly what we talked about before the drawdown of the NASDAQ relative to its high water point. Again, it's worth pointing out that it took many, many years, well into the 2010s, for the NASDAQ to recover from its peak valuation in 1999-2000, and that doesn't even adjust for inflation. But I want to bring your attention to the bottom part of this page. It looks almost like a mountain climbing and falling. That's what recessions look like in terms of companies going out of business. And when you looked at the substructure of who went bankrupt, earlier and who went bankrupt later, at least the last time around we had a tech bubble of the kind of magnitude we may be facing around the world right now, it tended to be the B2C companies that went bankrupt first. And the B2B companies, those that had convinced themselves they had some degree of recurring revenue, 
that went public, excuse me, that went bankrupt later. And why was that? Well, part of it was long-term contracts. Part of it was a degree of predictability in their business that let investors support them early on in the recession. But ultimately, what many of those B2B companies found was that other B2B companies, startups, and other B2C company startups were also an important part of the revenue base. And when the left chart of this bell curve went bankrupt, the right part of the bell curve went bankrupt in close succession. All that said, it is possible to create shareholder value in a recession. There were several thousand public companies at the beginning of 2008, and about 9% of them were able to create shareholder value over that period of time. If you look at the countries, look at the business models, it's a wide variety, all very unique and relevant to the times back then. But we want to emphasize, even in a recession, it is possible to create value, but it requires, according to Nguyen's law, Whatever your decrease in multiple is, it must be more than offset by the increase in your revenues or your gross profits or your cash flows. Usually, when you are worried about a recession, the Fed starts cutting rates. The yield curve has already inverted. But this is a unique situation. We're also experiencing runaway inflation, the most in almost 30 years, if not longer. So what are the Fed's degrees of freedom here? The Federal Reserve is trying mightily after a little bit of a period of perhaps, let's just say, artificially low rates to try to conquer inflation. And we take a great cue here from a friend of our firm's, uh, John Taylor. John Taylor uh, was uh, a member of the faculty at Stanford, is a member of the faculty at Stanford, was active in government, and he promulgated in the early 1990s something that's now called the Taylor Rule. In fact, it's such a simple, elegant idea, it fits on a single line of text on the right-hand side of this page. And what the Taylor Rule essentially says is, if GDP growth is a little soft relative to what it ought to be, well, you should lower rates a little bit. But if inflation is higher than it ought to be, you should raise rates a lot. Which means in a time when GDP growth is soft, but inflation is high, the net effect is still to raise rates. If you look at the last roughly 50, 60 years, even though the Taylor Rule was first laid out in the early 90s, the Taylor Rule does a pretty good job of actually measuring what the Fed actually did, except over roughly the last 10 years when rates were much, much lower than what the Taylor Rule would suggest. We want to actually visualize this for you. What you're about to see is a bit of a movie. It's effectively a sequence between what the Taylor Rule predicted the Fed rate should be on the x-axis and what the actual Fed rate was on the y-axis you can see periods of time where we're below the diagonal, like the 1970s. The Fed's rates were too low. And that gets counteracted by the Paul Volcker years in the 1980s when the Fed had to raise rates to fix the ills and the sins of the 1970s. It was on the other side of the diagonal. But look at where we were over the past two years. And it's easy to criticize the Fed. That's not our intention here. But look at the data. If you think about a couple of years back, the Taylor Rule actually projected we should have negative interest rates, which the Fed tried to do through a combination of a zero Fed funds rate and quantitative easing. But over a short period of time, what the Taylor Rule predicted the rate ought to be started climbing. In fact, it started to go much, much higher, approaching 10%. Yet, the Fed kept rates at zero we were starting to peel very far away from the diagonal. In fact, it has only really been in recent months that the Fed has begun to raise rates, just as the Taylor Rule starts to suggest that actually, had we followed the Taylor Rule, or at least had we found ourselves where we are today, we would actually want to start cutting them. Now, what are we trying to say here? In effect, the Taylor Rule said that we should have raised rates much, much faster and much, much sooner than what actually took place, and that, in addition to all the things we know about, like war in Europe and supply chain and COVID, is a major driver of the inflation we find ourselves in right now. And here's the dilemma. It isn't just enough to raise the Fed funds rate to be about equal to inflation. Look at the circles on this chart. Every single time that inflation has been an issue, the Fed funds rate in blue has had to puncture the red line and go way above it to try to tame inflation and bring it back down to where it needs to be. That's part of how inflation has been so low in the developed economies for such a long time, and even by extension around the world over the past 20 years. There's been discipline around puncturing the red line. But look at where we are right now. The blue line is still well below 
the red line. We believe that has only one implication. The blue line has to barrel, uh, b barrel through the red line sooner or later. Now, what does that look like, in fact? Well, let's show you another video. This basically shows you what the inflation rate is, measured as the PCE inflation, versus the actual Fed funds rate. Anytime you're in red territory, it's a dangerous place to be. Inflation's actually higher than the Fed funds rate. If you're in white territory, well, it's the other way around. This shows you the progress of the last several years. You can see the very dangerous 1970s, when the Fed probably acted too slowly, and then the massive but necessary correction under Paul Volcker. And now you can see the plot continuing into the 2000s and eventually moving to the present day. Take a look at where we are. And here we are. It's remarkably similar to what took place in the 1970s. The parallels are ominous and very, very real. The further you are in the red zone, the more dangerous it is. And it may not be enough to just cross over the diagonal line. Just like Paul Volcker did in the 1980s, it may be important to cross meaningfully into white territory, into the right side of this page, in order to fully tame inflation. Which raises a very practical question. Until inflation is quenched, and that might take a while, who benefits from high inflation in terms of sectors or business models? Commodities, of course, but who else? In a time of high inflation, there's no doubt that commodities do very well. Anybody that had exposure to oil or other sorts of commodities had an extraordinarily successful 2022. I was just exchanging notes with the guy that was the most successful mutual fund PM in America in all of 2022. He had a third of his portfolio in an energy royalty company. That did well for him that year. But who else? other than commodities, and from a tech perspective and a consumer internet perspective, who prospers? Well, let, let's take a walk down memory lane. There have been 11 spikes of elevated US inflation above 5% on a rolling three-year basis in the last 140 years. And again, you might ask, you guys are Southeast Asia guys, why do you care about this? We care about it because the US is very well quantified. We can find lessons from the past. And by the way, the current affluence of Indonesia is roughly where the US was in the Rutherford B. Hayes administration, plus or minus a decade or so. So we love learning from the past and applying it to the situations we find ourselves in today. 11 situations, 11 circles on this chart. Now, some of these crises go back a pretty long time and the data is not that great. Let's start with the very first of these crises. September 1948, just after World War II com uh, ended. What you see here are four companies that had pretty extraordinary three-year IRRs to public shareholders. And there's a common theme, affordable, value-oriented consumer products and services had terrific IRRs. In the 1970s spike, again, a terrific theme, affordable consumer products and services. Volume Shoe Corporation, now known as Payless, it's a, certainly a store that every immigrant family to America knows extremely well. 1975, a common theme, affordable consumer products and services. Jericho's fast food, the Echo Group of affordable home kitchenware, American stores, Mervyn's, great examples. 1981, again, Mary Kay Cosmetics, very affordable, Mac Frugal's Bargains Closeouts, Radio Shack, La Quinta Inns, very affordable, consistent quality price point consumer products and services. 1991, the most recent spike until the present day. Blockbuster, you might not think of that as a frugal company, but think about the $5 cost of renting a video compared to the $25 cost of bringing your entire family out to the Megaplex. Costco, Home Depot, Walmart, Southwest Airlines, the whole era of everyday low prices was a terrific winner during this period of low inflation, and high inflation. And look at the IRR, 81% annualized over three years. Phenomenal IRR. And now the present day. We can take a somewhat more global view, lots more countries to look at, and much better quantification. Alphamart, a terrific company in our region in Indonesia, 41% US dollar IRR. Tractor supply in the States, rural, affordable, everyday low prices. Spartan Nash, no relation. 29% IRR, Euro, uh, Europri in Norway, not a low affluence country, a very affluent country, but very affordable variety retail, 21% IRR in dollars. 
This is a very important theme. And we would like to call it something practical and relevant, which is what we call frugal tech. We are very much frugal tech investors. Shop back in our portfolio is all about cash back for consumers. Red Doors is affordable one, two, and three star hotels. Snap Ask is effectively democratizing tuition to make it viable almost by the drink. Gurangada is all about very bottom of the pyramid retail and improving efficiency to drive affordability. Carsum is the largest used car marketplace in our region, a much more affordable option than buying a brand new car. And SCI, of course, permits consumers to buy cross-border, often availing themselves of great prices from imported goods. This is going to be one of the most important investment themes over the next several years, along with cost cutting in general for corporations and all the businesses that enable cost efficiencies at the SG&A line item. But mark our words, what should CEOs do in a recession? They should be thinking about what their frugal tech strategy should be. If interest rates rise to lower inflation, what does that mean for valuation multiples? Nancy, it's a great question. Again, we talked earlier about how the blue line of the Fed funds rate has to puncture the red line and stay there for a while. Or back to the video, you have to cross over from the red triangle into the blue zone. That is going to have a pretty meaningful implication for exit multiples for companies, which we think should have an implication to how people think about entry multiples for companies. To talk about that for a second, again, if the blue line rises, that's going to have a cascading impact. Let me start with a nice data set that Robert Schiller at Yale has put together. Some of you have seen this before. It's basically about 140 odd years off the S&P 500's trailing 10-year PE. He calls it the CAPE, the cyclically adjusted PE multiple. Now this is very interesting in terms of just applying it to a set of earnings. But just humor us for a second and take what we learned in math class as kids, the reciprocal. This is A. Let's take 1 divided by A. You go from being 30x to being now 3.3%. And by converting the multiple into a yield, that lets us do something very interesting, which it lets us superimpose this exact same yield chart of earnings for equities on the yield chart for the 10-year treasury. An equity owner to business is taking a medium to long-term view on its prospects from a DCF perspective. That's certainly what the 10-year treasury is as well. And when you put the blue on top of the green, the eye can't help but notice, with the exception of some very interesting things that happened many years ago, there's basically a correlation. They sit on top of each other. In fact, over long periods of time, there's about 100 basis points of difference. The equity yield is about 100 basis points higher than the yield in the 10-year treasury. So it's not hard to follow the logic. If short-term interest rates have to rise to tame inflation, a la the Volcker years in the 80s, then there will be a consequent upward momentum on the 10-year rate. It may not be pound for pound, percent per percent, but the two-year horizon is part of the 10-year horizon. If the 10-year er rate goes up, well then earnings yields tend to be over long periods of times 100 basis points higher, which means when you unreciprocal it, back to a multiple, PE multiples will fall. This is a simple point to say, but hugely important. Over the last 40 years, most equity investors have been what I like to call kick saved. They've had narrow misses where they often misjudge, and I certainly fall in this category, I've gotten it wrong a lot of times, misjudged the PL and it was actually lower than they forecasted, but the IRR turned out okay because multiples were better than expected because 40 years of lower falling interest rates and therefore 40 years of rising PE multiples, the paradigm is likely going to change. I sure hope for a low interest environment sometime, certainly again in my lifetime, and it will happen. But the next few years are going to be crucial and we cannot bank on it, which means as we underwrite investments and we think about exits, we have to keep in mind falling exit valuation multiples. That has a very clear consequence for founders and entrepreneurs or companies. I love this imagery of how people are a lot more frugal with their toothpaste when it's running out of toothpaste. You fold up that tube and they're a lot less frugal when it's right out of the store. One of the things that's so powerful that my colleague Peter has discovered is that when you think about Southeast Asia private deployment into tech investments pre-IPO, it tends to correlate pretty well with the movement of the NASDAQ with a bit of a lag. We looked at a 100-day lag in this particular exhibit. Let me show it to you in a somewhat different way. This is the total amount of capital across all stages of capital, not just the Series C and D that Oliver talked about, going back to the mid-1990s. The blue periods were times of crisis. 
in Southeast Asia, economic crisis or otherwise. You can see the impact of the Asian financial crisis, the impact of the dot-com implosion, the global financial crisis, and we're only partway through what will be the 2022-23 slowdown in capital raising and capital markets. And by the way, if it's tough for all of Southeast Asia, at least historically, it's been even tougher for Indonesia specifically. There have been years, and some of this might be data availability, when that capital has gone almost to zero. Not in terms of LP commitments to funds, and not in terms of necessarily spending by companies, but capital going into companies by funds, year by year over this period of time, all stages. In fact, you're already starting to see something very interesting happening related to capital productivity. Our friends at Morgan Stanley produce this analysis every few weeks. If you look at just software companies, and again, it is US centric, but the data is very illuminating for what's happening all around the world. If you are a high growth and profitable software company, well, now you're trading at 8.8 .8 times 2023's revenues. But if you're only moderate growth and unprofitable, that's a dramatically different multiple. There is now intelligent and thoughtful discrimination between the top of this chart and the bottom of this chart in terms of how investors are valuing companies. That's again something that entrepreneurs have to give a lot of thought to. Which brings us to the million or even billion dollar question. When will the IPO markets reopen? Nancy, it's a very important question and one that we're thinking a lot about. We've got a bunch of our companies that hope to go public one day in our own portfolio. It's also a topic that's very close to my heart. One of the great, great opportunities I had in my career, I'm so grateful for it, was the opportunity to be the president of Seat Limited and lead its IPO back in 2017 on the New York Stock Exchange. And C's IPO wasn't just an enjoyable event and an interesting learning event, it's created real shareholder value. Now it's gone up and gone down over the years, but over the last roughly five and a half years since C's been public, it's been one of the 75 best performing large cap stocks on earth on a long-term basis had you bought at the time of the IPO. In fact, relative to other IPOs of large companies today, it's been one of the very best performing IPOs globally across all industries and one of the very best from a tech perspective, again, among somewhat larger companies that are out there in the world today. So we feel very proud of what C's done and our affiliation with it, but also more importantly, the learnings that we can draw from that in terms of thinking about where the IPO markets go next. Now it's worth pointing out that although C's IPO created a tremendous amount of value from its 2017 launch point to today, many of the IPOs more recently, especially in 2021, have not done as well. There were about 100 or so global tech IPOs in 2021, and the majority of them have broken issue price. They're on the left-hand side of this page in the red columns. A handful have created value, but far more have lost value. And this has created a little bit of a mood of pessimism all around the world. It's made people question, you know, did we do the right thing or the wrong thing in terms of investing in those companies? We're not going to answer that question, but we will say the following. If you look at how IPOs do, at the one year point after their listing, over a pretty long period of time, you see a three or four year cycle. We would sort of call this partly linked to the macro cycle, but frankly, there is a three or four year cycle in terms of IPOs being overvalued or undervalued at the time of their listing. When C went public in the second half of 2017, actually many companies that went public in that cohort, the second half of 2017, the median company was about flat over the first year. In fact, C itself had a pretty bumpy first year. I, I remember that vividly. However, the IPO class of 2021, they didn't just have a flat performance, they actually declined. And there have been many periods in the past, again, that three or four year cycle, where the classes actually declined. In contrast, there have been years, and you can see them on the chart, where the median IPO has done very, very well. We would simply point to this data set and say, look at 2021 in context. There's a cycle, and it was definitely a time of very overvalued IPOs, whereas 2017 was somewhere in the middle and there have been years when IPOs were arguably underpriced and did very, very well in the aftermarket. Which raises an important question. How big does a company need to be to be ready to be a public company? Now we focus a lot on gross profits. We think that gross profits really separate the great companies from companies that are, as they say, selling a dollar for a nickel. If you look at every IPO from emerging Asia going back a pretty long period of time. This is basically Asia excluding just Japan. And you look at the current gross profits of the company on the vertical axis and the year the company went public, obviously it drifts upwards to the upper left because those companies have been around longer, they've had more time to grow, 
But in general, once you're at about $25 million or gross profits or greater, you're definitely a contender to be a public company. Now, this is all industries, all exchanges, including some of the smaller local exchanges. If we now just look at the subset of those IPOs that were technology IPOs, specifically internet and software, again, interestingly, roughly $25 million of trailing gross profit. And if we take one final aperture and look at the companies that went public in America on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, again, about $25 million-ish, maybe a notch higher than that. This is a very important goalpost. When your company has $25 million plus of gross profits, that's the time to start thinking about going public in the US or locally here in Asia. But there's a second rule of 25, and that one isn't in an entrepreneur's control. It's when will the markets be ready for your company? You might be ready, but the market might not be. And we call it the second rule of 25 for the following reason. What you're looking at over here is called the VIX. It's basically an indicator, and it actually moves up, day and, up and down day by day, of how the markets think the next few months of volatility will be. When the VIX is high, people are worried about future volatility. When the VIX is unnaturally low, people are unnaturally complacent and calm about the markets. And if you take a look at this, it effectively quantifies capital markets fear. This is as much as anything else over 30 years, a psychological end product. And it looks exactly like this. Now this looks at 1990 to the present day. If you overlay with a somewhat rescaled right-hand side axis, just the last give or take 12 or 13 months, you can see that the VIX over the course of 22 has been a lot more elevated in terms of its distribution relative to the normal functioning of the global capital markets and the VIX in particular. This has a very important implication. And here's why. If you look at all the money that was raised in tech IPOs globally over the past 30 or so years by the level of the VIX on the day the company priced its IPO, you see a very strong drop off after 25. In fact, when the VIX is 25 or greater, there's a tremendous reduction in the amount of capital raised. Now you might say, well, hold on a second, that, that's just an artifact of the fact that on the previous page, the VIX isn't often above 25 anyway. So wouldn't you expect it to not raise that much capital above 25? Well, that is true, and we can adjust for that. So if you now look at how much capital is raised per trading day, whether or not an IPO happened or not, but per trading day to sort of index for that, what well, you see is something very interesting. Now on the surface, you might say, well, this doesn't seem to show much of a pattern. Yes, there's a small drop off at 25, but what you also have to do is recognize that there's three major outliers here, largely linked to large telecommunications IPOs, many of them quite far in the past. When you really take those out and think more about internet and consumer and software companies going public, it is much, much harder to do that when the VIX is greater than 25 which raises a great question. How long can the VIX stay above 25? What is that likely going to look like? Well, the VIX as of the day of this filming is actually briefly below 25, but over the course of 22, it's been quite elevated. And if you look at previous periods of time on a calendar day basis, what this chart at the top, which sort of looks like those stalagmites in a cave, is showing you is the number of cumulative days where the VIX was greater than 25 since 1990. And you can see there was a massive period of time around the global financial crisis when the VIX was indeed much greater than 25. But what's more common is sort of mini spikes, kind of choppy waters. And that's exactly what happened in the late 1990s and early 2000s in that dot-com period. And it looks to be what's happening to us right now. After all, what's happening right now isn't a massive real estate debt crisis. It's basically the correction to an overvaluation in the equity markets driven by low interest rates and a reaction quite sensible to inflation and rising interest rates. But here's the important point. If you look at each of those spikes in the cumulative greater than 25 VIX, they correspond to periods of missing IPOs. The chart at the bottom shows rolling one quarter IPO capital raising over that same period of time. See those gaps in the chart? those correspond to the blue triangles at the top of the page. And we're living through a period of choppy waters, just like the late 90s, and early 2000s as well, and that's likely gonna have an impact on IPO windows opening and reo closing, opening and closing, 
What we think is going to happen over the next year is something a bit less than 2000, a bit less like 2008 and 9 when the window was just shut and a little bit more like the early 2000s when it opened and closed, opened and closed, and entrepreneurs will basically need to hurry and then wait, get themselves ready, and then wait for just the right moment to get their public company out of the gates.